this evening, I'd like to um, uh, look a bit more carefully at what we use for the meditation this morning. For Mark chapter 2, um, uh, really in um, uh, verse 27, but I'd like to read uh, beginning in verse 23 rather than I think verse 22, which I may have said earlier, but beginning in verse 23 and read through verse 28. This is what Mark records by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And it happened that he was passing through the grain fields on the Sabbath. And his disciples began to make their way along while picking the heads of grain. The Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, have you never read what David did when he was in need? And he and his companions became hungry. How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priests. And he also gave it to those who were with him. Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is the Lord even of the Sabbath. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our understanding this evening. Now, this morning, remember, we were looking at the fact that the Sabbath, the fourth commandment, uh, continues. The day that God established uh, at the end of the creation week and he blessed for our good. That he gave again to his people, remember, when um, it was taken away from them when they were enslaved in in Egypt uh, after he brought them out of Egypt. uh, That he included in his Ten Commandments when he spoke to them at Mount Sinai and then, of course, um, basically inscripturated it when he engraved it with his own finger on the stone tablets. Um, Now, we see it continues because uh, we saw this morning, he said in the Old Covenant, uh, not only that it would continue in the new, but that those who kept it would be blessed, that it would mark and be a celebration of the day that his son would rise from the dead. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, Because as we've just been reminded here this evening, uh, Jesus declared himself to be the Lord of the Sabbath, and he gave us instruction on how we are to keep it. Because Jesus also says in the Olivet Discourse that it would continue even after his earthly ministry was done in 70 AD when Jerusalem would be surrounded by, his, by its uh, enemies. Jesus told the disciples, pray that when the time comes for you to run, that it doesn't fall on the Sabbath day. Uh, because the author to the Hebrews tells us that it does stand as a reminder that we may yet enter into God's rest, that we may yet enter into heaven because of what Jesus has done. Jesus has completed his work and entered into his rest. And because uh, God actually in the new covenant writes this law on our hearts just as he does the the rest of the commandments by the Holy Spirit giving us the desire and the power then to keep these commandments in the new covenant. Remember the blessing of the new covenant is no longer on stone tablets but now on the tablets of human hearts. God gives us a love for his commandments so that we will keep them. Keep them as children. Remember, you become a child and then you keep them. You don't keep them to become a child. Now, this evening, I want us to consider why God gave us the Sabbath. And so why it's, it's still important that we keep the Sabbath today. And again, wanting to link this to what we've been looking at. Where do we find the power to serve the Lord? Where do we find the spiritual energy that the disciples had, that those we've seen in church history had? Well, the Sabbath is a very large part of that. It's more expansive than that, but this is very important. Now, Jesus, first of all, tells us in our passage why it is that he made the Sabbath, why God you know, blessed that day, why he gave it to us. And, and the reason is simply uh, for our benefit, Uh, He says in in Mark 2.27, the Sabbath was made for man. Okay, the idea here is that it was made for his benefit, for his advantage. And notice, not man, for the Sabbath. Okay, God created man and he made the Sabbath for man as a benefit to man. He didn't create the Sabbath and then make man for the Sabbath's sake. Okay, so we need to see that 
we got to put it the right way around, which is what Jesus is actually addressing in this passage. Now, in the context, the Pharisees were accusing Jesus' disciples of breaking the law because they were picking grain on the Sabbath. You're working on the Sabbath. That's not lawful. You're breaking it. But as a matter of fact, the law actually said that they could pick the, these heads of grain on Sabbath if they were traveling, if it was a matter of necessity. That was a part of the law. Now, Jesus doesn't address that particularly, but rather addresses the idea that there are, there are priorities when it comes to the law of God. Jesus says what he said to reprove them for this idea, that the Father never intended for his people to go hungry for the sake of keeping the Sabbath. That wasn't his intent. He didn't make man for the Sabbath, in other words, so that he could keep the Sabbath. He made the Sabbath for man that he might be blessed by the Sabbath. I remember what we saw this morning and what I also mentioned again this evening, how the Lord gave the, the Jews, uh, when they came out of Egypt, manna, uh, the bread from heaven, a picture of Christ, and how he gave them just as much manna as they needed each and every day. The funny thing was that if they gathered too little, they, they had no lack. If they gathered too much, they had no surplus. They always had exactly what they needed, no matter how much they gathered, right? But they could only keep it for one day. If, if they kept it for more than a day, it would breed worms, it would spoil, and they couldn't eat it. But on the sixth day, the Lord allowed them to gather enough manna that would last for the sixth and the seventh day. And he also allowed it to keep for the extra day so that they wouldn't have to go out and gather it. They wouldn't have to go hungry on the Sabbath God did not give them the Sabbath to make things hard for them. God gave them the Sabbath, and he provided for them on the Sabbath so they might observe it and be blessed by it. Now, there's also in what Jesus is saying here uh, an example, um, again, to show us that God gives us uh, his commandments for our well-being and not for our hardship, uh, and that was of David and his companions eating this consecrated bread. Now remember, if somebody was not a priest, went into the house of God and took the showbread and ate it under any other circumstances, they would have been guilty and would have had to face the consequences for it. But David and his companions were not guilty because it was the only food that was available and they needed it to sustain their lives. There is a hierarchy when it comes to the commandments. Uh, God does not... Uh, call us to endanger life for the sake of keeping at least the commandments under certain circumstances. I realize that's a pretty broad statement. Uh, we don't have time to narrow that down too much. But the point I want to make is simply this, that God did not give us the Sabbath to put our lives at risk or to make it more difficult for us. He gave us the Sabbath in order to be a blessing to us. So the question we need to ask is this, how does this day benefit us? How does it become a blessing to us? What does God intend by giving it to us? Well, first of all, uh, the most obvious thing is uh, in the commandment itself, uh, the commandment is not to work but to rest. God gives it to us to give us rest. Now, remember, and I think we all know this from experience, God did not make us and I think for some of that I've been talking about as far as dealing with fatigue, God did not make us with the ability to go nonstop, right? We get worn out. Um, those who usually do go nonstop um, often end up dying early you know, or, or breaking down early because our minds and our bodies are not able to repair themselves. They're not able to continue to go on. That's why we have to be careful just how much we commit ourselves, how much work we commit ourselves to, that we don't bite off more than we can chew, we don't spend more than we have. And this might explain why some of our spiritual forefathers who did so much in so little time had such short lives. Uh, they literally burned out. Um, I think the Sixth Commandment warns us against doing that. Uh, we need to sleep Every night, we need rest. God made day and he made night and he made our bodies to respond to day and night so that we would rest. God wants us to rest. But we also need rest every week. 
And so the Lord established this day at the end of the creation week, you know, His work week, as we saw this morning, to be a day that we would rest. Moses writes, as we saw this morning in Genesis 2, verses 1 through 3, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their hosts. By the seventh day God completed His work which He had done, and He rested on the seventh day from all His work which He had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it He rested from all His work which God had created and made. Now, the Lord uses this as the reason why we are to keep the Sabbath holy. Just as God worked six days and then He rested on the seventh, so we are to work six days and rest on the seventh. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, not only are we to rest, but we're to make sure that everybody else that, that we have influence also rests. You know, our servants, uh, in, in this case, we don't have servants, but we have people that could feasibly serve us. We need to make sure we don't make other people work. Now, God didn't need to rest. God didn't get tired at the end of the creation week any more than He needed six days, really, to create everything. Uh, perhaps I've said this in the past, but Augustine, as he looked at, at uh, the creation week and he saw that God took six days to make everything, he said, why would God take six days to create something He could speak into existence in a moment? He must not have made it in six days. He must have uh, done it in an instant, but he's, he's explaining it this way so that the angels will understand what he did. That, that was Augustine's view. It was kind of a, a, an odd view. But it's just the opposite of what we see today. Well, you know, we see, you know, long periods of time, or at least this is what science is saying. It wasn't six days. They're somehow symbolic of longer periods of time. I think God took six days to do it. That's what the Bible says. But why did he take six days to do something he could have done instantly? Well, it's because he was creating a pattern for us, a pattern of working six days and resting on the seventh. That's why the, virtually the entire world observes a seven-day week, because we all come from the same parents who were influenced by this same pattern God gave to them. So first of all, it sets the pattern of our week, six days of work. And we've been reminded by the, the Puritans uh, what that means is not six days of rest and then a seventh day of rest, but it means we're to work for six days and, and get all of our work done, and then we rest on the seventh. Now, the question then comes, why do we rest on the seventh day? Is it only to refresh our bodies? Well, not just our bodies, but also our souls. This gives us the time to worship and to worship together. It's a day designated that's the same for all of us so that we can meet together as the people of God to worship. Now, worship is what we owe God, of course, by virtue of the fact that He created us. Adam and Eve owed God worship by, by virtue of the fact that He created them. He also made us, but He also redeemed us and recreated us in the Lord Jesus Christ, and so we are doubly indebted to Him, and certainly Adam and Eve were also after the fall. Now, this is how our first parents, after the fall and after their redemption, used the Sabbath. Moses writes this in Genesis 4, verses 3 through 5, and I think what we have here is an example of using the Sabbath day to worship the Lord, and we'll, we'll break it apart just briefly. Uh, Moses writes this, So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering. But for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. Now, how do we get worship on the Sabbath from this? Well, let's take a look at this. Well, first, first of all, I think we would agree that worship is taking place here, okay? Cain and Abel are bringing offerings to the Lord, and the reason why you do that is to worship the Lord. Now, we see from this passage that there was already a standard of how to worship the Lord in place of what was acceptable and what was not acceptable. Abel's blood sacrifice was accepted by the Lord, but Cain's grain offering was not accepted. And I think if we were to read a little bit further in verse 7, the fact that God told Cain, quote, if you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? In other words, if you do the right thing, then you won't be 
downcast because you're rejected. Do the right thing and you'll be accepted. This implies that Cain actually knew what it was that God required. He was giving him something he wanted to give him rather than what God wanted him to give. It also explains, of course, um, why he knew why Abel's offering was accepted. They would have learned this from their parents, from Adam and Eve, who learned it from God's example. Remember the first thing that happened after um, the, the curse upon uh, Adam and Eve and the serpent and so forth was that God in his mercy slew some of his animals, made a blood sacrifice, and he covered their nakedness with the skins of these animals. This, this was um, the first picture of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, of the shedding of the blood for their forgiveness and the covering of their sins. Uh, it was the institution of animal sacrifice. Uh, why would Abel ever get the idea that taking one of God's creatures and just you know, killing it and offering to the Lord, that that would be at all pleasing to God? It's only because they had God's example. So we see that there was worship taking place. We see there was a standard of worship, but there was also a time for worship. Now, as I read in this passage, the NASB, New American Standard, reads, in the course of time, they, they came with this offering. But literally, in the Hebrew, it, it says, at the end of days, they came with this sacrifice, at the end of days, which is synonymous with at the end of the week, at the end of the work cycle, they are now on the seventh day to worship the Lord. So I just bring this, point this out to say the Sabbath was being used even at the very beginning for worship. Now, when we get to the New Testament, clearly it's being used for that purpose, perhaps even more clearly, because this is how we see Jesus and the Jews observing the Sabbath. We read numerous occasions where Jesus went to the synagogue on the Sabbath um, because the Jews were gathered there to worship the Lord. And Jesus would teach them. Jesus would evangelize them. We also notice that Paul took advantage of this in his missionary journeys. When he went to places where the Jews were, he went to the Jews first with the gospel, but he went to where they were gathered, in the synagogue, on the Sabbath day, in order to evangelize like our Lord Jesus Christ evangelized. The Lord gives us the Sabbath, not only for rest, but rest so that we might worship. And again, we need to note that for the Jews, it was the seventh day of the week. It commemorated the completion of the old creation, which was destroyed by the fall. But for the church, it's the first day of the week to commemorate the completion of the new creation when our Lord Jesus entered into his rest after making everything new through his death on the cross. Now, the final question is, how is worship a blessing? Well, worship is a blessing because this is how we have communion with God. Now, this, this is really another way, I think, of looking at, at the means of grace. You know, we, we often talk about the means of grace, at least it's the way we f refer to them in, in this particular neck of the woods, okay? The different ways that God has given to us to get more of the help of His Holy Spirit. But what we're really talking about when we're talking about the means of grace are the different ways in which we can have communion with God, different ways in which we can spend time with God. As a matter of fact, that's what we're doing right now. We're spending time with Him. We're having communion with Him. We're developing our relationship with Him. We are talking with Him, and He is talking uh, with us. Now, again, think of the means of grace in, in terms of communion with God. How does God speak to us? He speaks to us through His Word. He tells us about Himself. Now, we know that God speaks in the creation. We know there's general revelation, and He's speaking to the whole world and telling the whole world what He's actually like. But here He speaks to us much more clearly than He speaks there. He tells us again about what He's like. He tells us how much he loves us and how He sent His Son for us. He tells us how we can love Him. He tells us what He likes and what He doesn't like. God is speaking to us in, in the Word. This is how He speaks to us. I mean, there, there may be other ways as well, certainly I said creation. 
speaks to us in open and closed doors providentially, right? He opens and closes doors. Sometimes, uh, you know, there might be that nudge he gives to us um, uh, to, to kind of, you know, move us one direction or another. But it, if there's any understanding, anything verbal, it comes through the Word. So, first of all, let's realize that if this is the only way that God is speaking directly to us is in His Word, we need to make sure that we listen to what He has to say. If we don't read the Word of God, then we're essentially saying, I don't want to listen to you. It's like turning a deaf ear to God. He's speaking, and we need to listen to what He has to say. Uh, now, secondly, prayer is how we speak to Him. It's how we can tell Him, at least one of the ways, we can tell Him that we love Him. It's how we can ask for His help. It's how we can find uh, His wisdom. You know, when you stop and think about it, uh, we can actually have, we are having a conversation. That's one of the ways that um, worship has been characterized in the history of the church is this is a conversation that we're having with God. Uh, we speak to Him in prayer. He speaks to us in His Word. But we can also have a conversation with God in our, in our own personal private time with the Lord as well. Uh, we can ask Him questions, you know, Lord, what should I do about this? How, how should I, you know, how do you want me to live or deal with this particular issue? And we can get answers from the Lord, you know, not through like a special word of revelation, not through plain Bible roulette, you know, just kind of open up the Bible and point your finger down at it like that, but asking the Lord for His wisdom and then just waiting for his answer. Sometimes the Lord brings to mind a passage of Scripture that you've read. There's sometimes when, when I've been praying where I'll, I'll ask the Lord a question, almost immediately this passage comes to mind. It's like, oh yeah, that's, that's the answer to the question. Or he may lead you to a passage of Scripture as you're studying the Bible. Sometimes it's not as easy as remembering. Sometimes you have to dig in a little bit more deeply. But again, we can have conversation with the Lord, and we ought to be having conversation with the Lord. That's why He's given us prayer, why He's given us His Word. Uh, when we sing, we're expressing our love and our devotion to Him. When He gives us the sacraments, He's expressing His love for us. Every time we see the Lord's table laid in front of us, remember Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. This is my body broken for you. This is my blood shed for you. He's declaring His love toward us. So this is how we develop our relationship with the Lord. This is how we have communion with the Lord. Now, the most important thing is this, that when we have this communion, there is something that is wonderful that, that takes place when we connect with the Lord by faith and by the power of the Holy Spirit. The more we spend with Him, the more time we spend with Him, the more communion or, or intimacy of communion we have with Him, the more we are going to become like Him, okay? We're talking about power. This is where the spiritual power comes from, by connecting with the Lord. Uh, perhaps as an illustration of this, think about what happened to Moses. And I think it was, it was meant not to tell us that this is going to happen on a one-to-one -one correspondence with us if we spend time with Him. But think about what happened to Moses when he spent 40 days and 40 nights with God on Mount Sinai. We read in Exodus 34, verse 29. It came about when Moses was coming down from Mount Sinai, and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand as he was coming down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because of his speaking with him. Now, if we were to go on reading in this chapter, we would find that every time Moses went into the tent of meeting, he, would, he had a veil over his face because of this glory that was shining from his face, and he would take the veil off to speak with God. And when he came out, he would put the veil again over his face because it was kind of frightening to the Israelites to see him glowing uh, in this way. But in the New Testament, we learn he was actually covering his face so they wouldn't see the glory fade, the, glo you know, the fading glory of the old covenant because of the new covenant that was, that was coming. But there's a sense in which being with the Lord in His presence changed Moses. I think it changed him in more ways than one. Now, I'm not saying if we spend time with the Lord that we're going to start glowing like Moses glowed. That, that would be interesting if that were the case. That would certainly be a powerful testimony. But there is something similar that, that happens to us. 
we begin to radiate more of his character. You know, Jesus really characterizes us as lights that he has put in the world, and he wants us <clears throat> to shine. And when we spend time with the Lord, we, we become a bit more like him, and we, we share something more of his character and of his heart. We begin to live a little bit more as he calls us to live, and that is light shining in the world. I thought it was also interesting how when the Lord was preparing the prophets uh, to, to do the work that he had called them to do, that he encountered them, first of all, that they spent, as it were, time in his presence. Sometimes he would lift the prophets up into his heavenly uh, courtroom, into his, into his council, right? Like Isaiah was lifted up and he saw the Lord high and exalted and the, the train of his uh, you know, glories filling the temple and so forth. Sometimes he came down to earth, such as he did with Moses. I mean, Moses saw him on the mount. Moses saw him in the tent of meeting. There was one occasion where the Lord made all of his glory to pass in front of Moses. So as you know, the Lord put him in the cleft of the rock so that he would only see the trailing edges because of how glorious he was. He couldn't stand in the presence of God. Otherwise, it would destroy him. But the idea is that this is how the Lord prepared his people in order to do the ministry that he had called them to do. He revealed himself to them before he sent them to proclaim his message. Now, the Lord wants us to spend time with him in worship, in communion, that he might prepare us to do what it is he has called us to do. When we commune with him, when we see his glory through the eyes of faith, it transforms us not in exactly the same way again as it did Moses, or, or, but perhaps like it did the prophets, it transforms us a bit more into his image. Think about what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. That veil was also a picture of the unbelief of the Jews and how it was removed in Christ. But Paul has in mind here that same instance of Moses and the veil. And he says, we in the new covenant are like those with, like Moses, with an unveiled face beholding, although still in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, but seeing it transforms us into his image by the Holy Spirit. So again, means of grace, the way we get the help of the Holy Spirit, another way of looking at it is this is how we have communion with God, and as we see his glory, it transforms us. It makes us shine. Now, this is why the Lord gives us the, the Sabbath and why he wants us to keep it holy, to set it apart from the other days of the week, to set ourselves apart from the things of the world, because if we don't do that, we're not going to receive this blessing uh, of this transformation. And again, remember our meditation. I think this is really what the Lord has in mind here in Isaiah 58, verses 13 through 14. If because of the Sabbath you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord, honorable and honor it, desisting from your own ways, from seeking your own pleasure and speaking your own word, then you will take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth, and I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now we know that in the new covenant, the blessings that the Lord gives to us, especially in life, are more spiritual in nature than, than physical. And a lot of these blessings in the old covenant were essentially physical because they were pictures pointing to the spiritual realities. But I think what he has in mind here is that if we keep the Sabbath the way he calls us to do and spend that time in communion with the Lord, we are going to be fed with the, the true heritage, which is what Jesus purchased for us in his life and death, and that is more of the Holy Spirit, more of his likeness, more of the ability to do what the Lord calls us to do. Now that is why the Lord has given us the Sabbath, is so we will be able to spend this time with it. And so we, that's how we need to view it. That's how we need to receive it as the Lord intends it, as a blessing to us. Now, we do need to spend time with the Lord every day. You know, we, we can't just go 
and, and commune with him on one day of the week. We need to spend time with him every day. We need to learn how to walk with the Lord all day, every day, through the day, communing with him, praying with him, or praying to him and listening to what he might tell us again through, through his word. But we also need to commit ourselves to honoring him on his holy day, to meet together, to worship him publicly, but remembering that the Sabbath day is not just the Sabbath morning hour or the Sabbath evening hour, but it, it is, is the whole day that we need to spend the day with him, in communion with him. Uh, again, building that relationship, connecting with him, uh, not just going through the, the motions again. Sometimes it can devolve to that. Sometimes it can become just rote reading and prayer and, and not really prayer and faith, not really reading the word in faith, not really seeking to know the mind of the Lord, not really loving him the way we should. Uh, we need to really connect with him, uh, spend time in his presence. And as we do, we will become more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is what he saved us to become more like him. So let's pray the Lord will help us uh, to use uh, the Sabbaths in this way and to receive them as a blessing that the Lord intends them to be. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask for the Lord's grace to be able to do this.